screen. Uh, Lorna Harris is a molecular geneticist at the University of Exeter College of Medicine and Health. And uh, she will present to us about uh, oligonucleotide cell therapies for the diseases of aging. Um, I don't see uh, uh, Lorna. Can you show yourself on screen? I don't know. I'm not sure I can. I only have one screen, but I am here. <laughs> You're already here. We see you. Okay, you see you and hear you, so it's fine. Thank you. Wonderful. So, so thank you very much, first of all, for the invite and the opportunity to tell you about some of the work that, that we've been doing over the, the last 15 years, really. So, um, so thanks for the, the invite there. Um, so I'm a professor of molecular genetics at Exeter, but I'm also founder and chief scientific officer of Sinisca, which is a spin-out company that's, that's grown out of our research. So we know now that ageing and age-related diseases share, um, they track back to one or two common causes. These are a series of interconnected basic health maintenance mechanisms that we all know as the hallmarks of aging, that when they're dysfunctional contribute to the aging process. So there are three criteria that need to be met before something is characterized as, as a hallmark. It needs to be present during normal aging, preferably in multiple species. Its experimental induction should promote aging, um, aging phenotypes and its experimental ablation should improve aging phenotypes. And until very recently, there were nine recognized hallmarks, which include things like altered cellular, intracellular communications, telomere attrition, mitochondrial dysfunction and cellular senescence. But very recently, there have been another five hallmarks um, proposed, which include compromised autophagy, microbiome disruption, inflammation, altered mechanical processes, and this phenomenon called, called splicing dysregulation. And I was really pleased to see this categorized as a hallmark. I've been shouting for about 15 years that I think this should be a hallmark. Uh, and I'm going to present you some data today to show you indeed that we think it is and that we can um, and we can target this for rejuvenation of first nest cells. So the evidence, I think, that uh, dysregulated RNA processing is a hallmark. Um, so these are all data that have come out of my team, but there are also other other studies that have come out of other people's work as well. But we showed back in 2011 that dysregulation of uh, splicing in particular um, is that the genes that regulate this process are amongst the most dysregulated during uh, aging in human populations. And we've shown this in multiple populations now. We've also shown that the factors that regulate uh, splicing decisions are dysregulated in senescent cells. Of all the lineages we've looked at so far, we've looked at over 12 different cell lineages and we always see it. Uh, we've also shown that splicing factors are dysregulated in progeroid syndrome. So in fibroblasts from people with hutchinson gilbert progeria or Werner's syndrome, they have splicing factor profiles that look remarkably like those of, of old wild type cells. We've shown that it's associated with lifespan in animals and also in humans, and that it's causally involved in response to dietary restriction. And in some work that came from Ben Lee and my team um, a few years ago now, we also show that splicing factor expression is predictive of human aging phenotypes, including cognitive dysfunction and frailty. So I'm going to take a little bit of an aside now for those of you who are not so familiar with RNA processing, who don't love it as much as I do. But so, so what is it? So basically, it's the collection of processes that have to happen to a primary transcript or it can be turned into a mature transcript to make a protein, or not, as the case may be, as we now know that some RNAs don't actually make proteins. There are three basic steps. There's the addition of a five prime cap. This is important for initiation of translation and also for stability. The addition of a poly A tail, which is necessary for uh, RNA stability, and also for the removal of these non-coding introns that separate the of, uh, of RNA here that are coding these introns. So this is the central dogma of molecular biology. It's what we've been teaching our undergraduates for decades, and it's unfortunately not correct. So 98% of our, of, our, um, transcript, of, of our genome actually produces more than one product. So most genes make an average of about three isoforms, but there are extremes. So there are several mechanisms by which this, can, uh, this could happen. Um, you can get alternative promoters or you can get alternative poly polyethylation sites, but probably the most predominant mechanism is alternative splicing. So this is a, a mix and match, basically, of the different exons in the transcript. So some isoforms have some of them, but not others. Um, and you can get independent isoforms, which are independently transcribed, uh, independently translated to make you know, whatever they, that gene makes. They can be expressed at different times in different places, and they're a really fundamental underpinning of the molecular response to stress. And they're absolutely critical for um, transcriptomic adaptability and plasticity. 
So why should these genes be involved in senescence? So the simple answer to that is they don't just do splicing, they do lots of other stuff as well. So of course, when they're dysregulated, you get genome-wide dysregulation of splicing. You also get an increase in aberrant splicing, which is a problem because these proteins are also involved in RNA surveillance. So they're part of the RNA QC processes. So these transcripts, which normally would be degraded, start to accumulate. They're involved in RNA export, so you get um, faulty transport of, of transcripts from the nucleus. They're also involved in impaired transcriptomic response to cellulitic salt. Of particular relevance to senescence, they're involved in destabilization of cytokine RNAs. So when, you, when they're dysregulated, you get these, these, these RNAs get stabilized and hang around longer. And they're also involved in telomere maintenance. So actually, it's not really to me that surprising that these things are involved in senescence because they do they, they interface with so many senescence related processes. So showed a few years ago now that you can actually attenuate spl splicing map factor expression with small molecules. So this heat map here, this is, um, this is our human primary double fibroblasts, old, old cells, six different analogues of a phenol compound. Um, and Red is down and green is up. And you can see these are the controls here and these are after treatment. And you can see that pretty much all of our leading edge splicing factors here, these are the ones which came top in our epidemiology. These are all switched back on when we attenuate with small molecules. This is accompanied by changes in the splicing to some uh, very important senescence genes, as you can see here. So we can attenuate the expression of these things in, in vitro at least. When we attenuate splicing factor expression, this is associated with about a two thirds drop in the senescent cell load of the cultures. So in this top panel here, these are again, these are dermal fibroblasts and about 71% senescence assessed by SAB. These are treated cells, now about 24% senescent. So you can see, as I said, about a two thirds drop in the senescent cell load. This is accompanied by about a two thirds uplift in the proliferation index. So cells have re-entered cell cycle. This is a senomorphic effect, not a senolytic effect, so we don't see any increases in cell death. We also are able to rebuild our telomeres. So this is key PCR data. Um, these are our control old cells. These are young cells for comparison, and these are cells treated with a variety of analogues of other molecules we were interested in at the time. And you can see all of these actually have brought about a telomere elongation, in some cases up to the same sorts of levels as we're seeing in young cells. And the final proof of the pudding really that these things are causal is that if we knock them down in young cells, this is sufficient to induce senescence. So this time this is an endothelial cells. And here we've taken young endothelial cells and we've knocked out one or the other of a selection of different splicing factors, but I've just shown you two of them here. And when we knock these down in just one gene in isolation, this is enough to induce senescence. So this is proof that these things are on the causal side of the equation. So why these things dysregulated during aging? Well, to cut a very long story short, it's because of constitutive and unresolved activation of a couple of cellular signaling pathways, including ERK, and AKT. And these pathways are, of course, very important for lots of things in the cell. And of course, they interface with a lot of other signaling pathways. Um, and together, these pathways can be activated by things like DNA damage, inflammation, dysregulation of growth, uh, growth factors and oxidative stress, which, of course, are all classical aging stimuli. So in a, in a therapeutic setting, we wouldn't necessarily want to be attenuating ERK or AKT signaling because they're very pleiotropic within the cell. So we went hunting for what the effector genes were. And again, to cut a long story short, we tied it down to these two genes here. So the, these are two genes. One is ETV6 and one is FOXO1. FOXO1 is, of course, a very old friend to the longevity field, first longevity gene ever discovered, but never previously been tied into splicing regulation. ETV6, really a bit of a black box. No one had ever really describe this in much detail for anything, actually. When we knock them down individually, and again, we're back in primary human dermal fibroblasts here, you can see that knockdown of either ETV6 or FOXO1 is sufficient to restore splicing factor expression relative to old cells. Interestingly, when we knock them down together, the effect is negated. So this is evidence of an auto-regulatory feedback loop that, and a cross-regulatory feedback loop also between these two proteins. What's happening with senescence? Well, when we knock down either ETV6 or FOXO1, we see a drop in the, in the senescent cell load in the culture. This is also associated with an increase in cell cycle when you knock them down one at a time. When we knock them down together, however, the effect is ablated. 
and we, we see um, we see no effect on senescent cell load and we see no effect on proliferation. So we have characterized this feedback loop and we can see, so we know we know what's going on here, but these two pathways talk to each other and the, the genes indeed talk to each other as well. So what do these genes do? Well, they're transcriptional regulators. They turn other genes on and off. And because of the evidence that we had that they are, um, they're cross-regulatory, we were interested in their common targets. So we did some chromatin immunoprecipitation studies whereby we, we fished out the genes which were co-regulated by FOXO1 and ETV6. And we identified a panel of 242 genes which were common targets of these two transcriptional regulators. And when we look at what those genes do by gene set enrichment analysis, what pops out is senescence. They're also configured, a lot of these genes are configured in auto-regulatory loops. So this then gives us a unique opportunity for targeting. Many genes that are important in maintenance of homeostasis for many different mechanisms in the cell are actually configured in these sorts of loops, which allows us to target them in a very specific context. And we found several loops involving, as I said, involving our target genes in senescence that we can modify with oligonucleotides to modulate the effect. So this is what these loops tend to look like. So we have our target genes, which actually auto-regulate as well as cross-regulate. So they, they hold themselves in a Goldilocks zone. These genes exert a negative pressure on a bunch of senescence genes, including P16 and P21. Then that in turn, these genes are responsible for coding for a set of intermediates that negatively regulate our target. So that's how they're configured. We're looking to target these loops using oligonucleotides in a therapeutic context. So, well, why oligonucleotides? We can use an oligonucleotide um, to target the relationship between the regulated targets and what is regulating them in a very precise manner to restore splicing factor expression and ameliorate the negative effects of senescence. And we're doing this in the context of age-related diseases. Triggers are super useful because you can use them to switch genes on. If you sit them over negative regulatory elements, you can use them to switch genes on. You can switch genes off using conventional siRNA, or you can target positive regulatory elements. You can even use them to influence splicing, so you can make cells make whatever isomes you want them to make by putting, putting your, oligo, your oligo over the control regions. They've got a number of, of advantages over your conventional targets. You can use them to drug undruggable targets. So if you're using a small molecule modality, you are reliant on there being a convenient binding pocket that you can target. Using an oligo, you can target pretty much any part of the gene. The chemistries are well understood and evolving, and we can use low doses. So in our hands, we have these down to about a nanomolar. You can administer them very precisely with very, off, very little off-target effect because of the nature of the specificity of that association. And if you administer them locally, you get very little systemic exposure, particularly at the doses we're using. So how are we using them? So if we come back to our loop, Here's a young healthy cell. Our target gene is, is in its Goldilocks zone. It's expressing itself within its natural physiological bounds, it's exerting a negative regulatory pressure on the senescence genes. Now, this loop is therefore silent. As we age, we lose our splicing regulators. So this gene starts to fall out of homeostasis. You lose this block here. The switch gets the, the these genes get switched on, producing the intermediate, which comes around and switches our gene off even more. So this is in fact a biphasic switch for senescence. What we're doing is we're inter interfering with this. So in our old cells, our senescence genes are active, the intermediates are active, but we're sitting out oligo, the binding site here, but it can't interact with our target. Target gene starts to rescue, then is held in check its own autoregulation in its natural homeostatic range. Switch flips, senescence genes start to get turned off, intermediate gets switched off, and our cell is now back in its natural homeostatic range and rejuvenated. But just to show you how that this actually does work in, in normal cells, so these are human primary lung. These are young cells at population doubling about 20. These are the same population at population doubling 84, so this is replicative senescence. All of these panels are stained with SAB, but of course you can't see anything here because they're young the old cells, and you can see they've picked up the SAB. The morphology is also very characteristic of senescent lung. These are basically the same culture, but treated without oligo. So you can see the morphology has come back to where they were before. We are still seeing some senescent cells in here, and we will because some senescent cells are senescent because they've got catastrophic damage. We're also starting to see a little bit of uh, formation of these mitotic foci as we see in the young cells. So this works in young, in old, normal cells. 
When we look at what the kinetics look like, so this is senescence measured by SAP, at a 55% drop in senescent cell load. We also see a drop when measured with P16. Um, not all senescent cells are P16 positive, um, so the effects are not quite as marked, still see it. We're also seeing about a 30% drop in the DNA damage load in the cultures. So this is measured by gamma H2AX. We're seeing a little bit of um, initiation of proliferation here again. So some of the cells have come back into cell cycle. Because we are interested primarily in the first instance in the context of fibrotic lung disease as an exemplar disease of aging that we can, we can explore with our new oligos. We're looking at markers of fibrosis. Um, old lung cells show a lot of the same fibrotic markers as do cells with, uh, from patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, for example. So these three genes here are, mar are fibrotic markers. The two is actually a transdifferentiation marker that picks out cells which are transdifferentiated to myofibroblasts and laying down an aberrant matrix. Our oligos can switch this back down, indicating that they've gone back to fibroblasts. Collagen 1A1, of course, a very important component of the fibrotic extracellular matrix. Our oligos are, are shutting down the expression of this. Gremlin 1 is the, one of the initiating cascades of fibrosis. We're able to switch that down. Conversely, if we're looking at markers of, fibro of um, anti-fibrotic effects and fibrosis resolution, this gene here, LIF, is a gene that negatively regulates collagens um, and it's associated with protection against fibrosis in lung, liver and kidney. And we're seeing this is beginning to get switched up. We have capthecin L and hemoxidase 1, which are antifibrotic markers. And this oligo in particular is, is pretty potent with these. We're getting a nice switch up. This oligo, and this um, gene here, MMP14, is collagenase 9. Um, and we're able to switch this up. So this raises the interesting perspective that we might not only be able to stop fibrosis, but we may potentially even be able to start to resolve it. So we're harnessing this in the context of IPF. So in IPF, you get an epithelial cell insult, which causes the epithelia to become senescent. Secreted SAS then goes through into the stroma, and then that causes senescence in the fibroblasts. Fibroblasts then get, uh, because of TGF-beta, get elicited to turn into myofibroblasts, which elicits the fibrotic effects. And concurrently, because your immune system is also senescent, you don't get the clearance. And because your stem cell compartments are also senescent, you don't get the repair and resolution that you would see in a younger individual. So the thinking is that removal or rejuvenation of senescent cells will actually address multiple aspects of fibrosis and repair. So just in my last few slides, um, we're starting to look at this in the context of IPF. So the first thing we showed was that cells from IPF patients are prematurely senescent. So this is a young, uh, a young population of, of normal lung cells, typical fibroblast morphology. They're dividing, as you can see by the um, 67 foci here, and actually not very much damage. These at the bottom, these are cells from a 55-year-old male IPF patients. The cells are passage matched, so they're both at around 25 population doubling, and you can just immediately see that the difference in the cell morphologies, you've got a lot of senescence in here. A little bit less proliferation. They're still young cells, so you would still expect some of the cells to have proliferative capacity, a lot more damage. And when we graph that, we can see our senescent cell load is about four times higher. We have about 40% less division, and again, about four to five times more DNA damage. So what happens when we treat these cells? So what you're looking at here is just a slightly higher magnification with a tagged oligo so that you can see we're getting it into the cells. This is what our young cells look like. These are the young normal cells. These are our young IPS cells. And again, you can see the collection of senescent cells here. And these two panels here are IPF cells, but treated with two of our oligos. And you can see just, just by looking, you can actually see the fibroblast morphology has kind of come back where it should be. As I say, we still have some senescent cells, but nowhere near as many. When we graph that, we have about 50% about of our senescent cells, uh, our senescent cell load has, no, has come down. We do see a, a, an increase in proliferation. Um, I think this is probably reactivation of some of the quiescent cells in the population, which is why we see so much of it. But I think some of those senescent cells may well have, have gathered a little bit of ability to divide. We're seeing a lot less DNA damage, about four, four to five times less DNA damage in the case of Sol45. We're also seeing a reduction in, in inflammation. So IL-6, which is your post gene for the SAS, uh, certainly in lung, we've got about a two-thirds drop in SAS. We're starting to see a nudging up of the antifibrotic markers. To see these properly, we really need to get these cells on a matrix and do a much more um, in-depth experiment, but we are starting to see them moving. So targeting splicing dysregulation may be a fruitful source of new senotherapeutics. 
So to conclude, regulation of RNA processing is a new and druggable hallmark of human aging. And splicing factors can be restored in aging human cells using small molecules or genetic interventions like oligonucleotides. And this influences senescence phenotypes. And targeted moderation of splicing factor expression can influence not only senescence phenotypes, but also attenuate disease markers in cells from patients with premature aging diseases. I'll just finish with some acknowledgements. So this has been about 15 years work in the making. And obviously over that time, it's involved a lot of collaboration. And so this is my team. The, the guys picked out in sort of pale blue here are my academic team. The guys in, in white are my Sinisca team. And there are some past lab members who've been involved in this work. And then the other people I'd like to particularly draw attention to are the, uh, the, the team at the NIH, so Luigi Ferrucci and his team, who've been were instrumental with the, the epidemiology, and uh, colleagues at the University of Brighton who helped us out with the very first study with the polyphenol analogues. So I'll finish there, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorna. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, so the first is from Leon. By the way, if you prefer to ask yourself, you're welcome. Uh, if not, uh, <laughs> Uh, the DNA mutilation has been uh, connected to slicing uh, before. Do you see or plan to look into the effect of DNA uh, mutilation uh, with your intervention? Yeah, we've done this actually. Um, it, not a very exhaustive study. Um, what we see when we're looking at the methylation clocks, we start off with cells that are about 64. The, um, the young, and then we can rejuvenate them back to about 18 or 19 actually. We've only done this one or two times and we are actually working up some um, transcriptomic clocks at the level of splicing, which are one of the outcome measures that we will be using to, to assess this. Okay, great. Um, and uh, Anton, once again, if you want to ask yourself, just raise your, your hand. Okay, uh, okay, I can ask. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so right now you mostly apply it to uh, cell cultures, but yes. when you will uh, apply it to the whole organ, you can uh, have a situation that uh, uh, it's very important for some genes to have very different alternative isoforms uh, uh, in different tissues. How yes. can you control that you accidentally don't break uh, it between tissues? Sure. So there's, there's two answers to that question. So the first answer in a therapeutic um, context, this is one of the reasons why we are using oligos and we're using them locally so that we can deliver them directly to the target organ and then um, and the risk of systemic exposure at, at the doses we're using is actually fairly minimal. That said, even in a systemic context, actually the risk is not, is, there's not an issue because we're not making these splicing factors do anything, we're not pushing them into a range that they wouldn't normally be at. So we're, we're nudging them back into their normal natural homeostasis where they will self-regulate as they would normally without intervention. So we're just giving them a, a helping hand back into that homeostatic range. Thank you. And uh, Aubrey asked a question. Aubrey, do you want to ask yourself uh, or should I read it? Uh, yeah, sure, I'll ask it. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a standard question that you've had a thousand times before, Lorna. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I thought it would be worthwhile not to have it omitted today. Um, yes. As in, um, so why would we want to rejuvenate senescent cells since they're bad for us and there aren't very many? Right. Of them okay. Them? All right. So the first answer to that is, as, as I think most of us know, there's not just one type of senescent cell. Okay. So some cells are senescent because they have massive damage and that they've become senescent as a protection against malignancy. Those ones we will not be able to touch. Those ones have got ongoing damage signals which are pushing you know, pushing our regulators out of their homeostasis, activating those pathways constantly. So there's no way we'll be able to do those. Um, in terms of why we would want to rejuvenate them, I think it's not so much rejuvenate them. What we really want to do is to stop them doing the bad stuff that they're doing. So actually the, the primary outcome here is to stop them releasing the SASP. The other thing, of course, is that not all senescent cells are bad for you. Some senescent cells, and we're beginning to know now that especially in places like the lung, there are niches of senescent cells that are actually necessary for wound, you know, for, for remodeling and for wound healing. So those types of senescent cells will not be dysregulated. They will not have the splicing factor dysregulation because that the, the, they're still capable of, of, of keeping them in their homeostatic range. So we won't touch those. I think the ones that we are actually rejuvenating are the ones which are senescent because of the paracrine action. 
And I think, you know, I'm not worried about making them divide. I don't want to completely reanimate them. What I want them to do is to stop secreting the sap. Thanks. Uh, and the last question for Patricia, if you want to, to ask, and we have to move on. Uh, you still oh, muted. You're muted, Patricia. <laughs> I've, 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 just to say, it was a fantastic talk. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, very enthusiastic uh, person. <laughs> uh, You've got to love what you do. If you don't love it, no one else is going to love it. Very nice. I just wondered in your constitutive pathway list you uh, showed if you ever looked to uh, raw R because in endothelial cells specifically, the inhibition uh, by uh, finalization of raw R has been shown to stop oncotransformation and as thus. So this would have to be included, I think. Yeah, we haven't looked at that so far, but interestingly, there are a couple of uh, our targets that come up in our list. Mm -hmm. That's so yeah, I mean, it's on the it's on the list of things. We, we have a massive list of, of pa pathways and processes we want to look at. That will be on the academic side though, not not in the, um, the no, industrial okay, setting. But still, there yes. are small molecules that are specifically doing the job. Absolutely. Okay, okay great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorna, for this talk.